Our gospel for today comes from Luke, the 12th chapter. Jesus said, Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat and he will come and serve them. And if he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them, blessed are those slaves. But know this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. Holy God, give us grace and open our hearts and minds to hear your true and living word, Jesus the Christ, who will transform our lives. Amen. So last week, Jesus took some of the crowd that was following him to task for, um, what should we call it, Uh, their obsession, their overemphasis, their preoccupation with money. He told them the parable of the man who had placed his faith in his stuff and how none of that matters when your life can go poof at any time. This week, he continues pushing on the idea that we are too infatuated with things like money, like working all the time, like trying to find meaning in stuff. You know, things that just don't matter when it really comes down to it. Jesus loves to talk about money and our delusions and phobias around it. Because, well, we've been doing this for at least 2,000 years or more. We love to make money the ruler by which all things are measured. Now this week, Jesus points out that we also don't live in the kingdom. We don't participate in the eternal life because we're afraid. We're afraid to trust that God will provide for us. Our hearts are in our money and our stuff rather than in the treasures of relationships and love. So Jesus says, sell all your possessions and give it to the poor. Now, we're not comfortable with that statement or that idea, are we? Sell our possessions and give it to charity? You know, this isn't the first time that Jesus says this either. Are we suppo- what are we supposed to make out of this? Does Jesus really want us to sell everything and give it all away so that we're poor too? Is Jesus nuts? All right, well, let's take a step back and let's look at some other faith traditions. Buddhism. There's the concept of dana or almsgiving which is the beginning of the path to nirvana. In Hinduism, the idea is utsarga, or almsgiving, which is giving for public benefit, which is obligatory and has to be done on a daily basis. Islam, the concept is called zakat, or almsgiving, and it's actually the third of the five pillars of Islam, and it is also obligatory. Not just once, but constantly. One of the basic principles of Islam is that all things belong to God and we only hold them in trust. Now, Judaism. You remember Judaism, the the precursor to our Christianity. The concept here is tzedakah. Almsgiving is a religious obligation. If you say you are religious, you do this, you give. And they even have eight laws about giving that goes from the best or the most righteous, the purest, to the poorest or the flimsiest 
or the least righteous. So the first, the most righteous way that you can give is to give so that it enables the recipient to become self-reliant. The second way is to give when neither party knows the other's identity. The third most righteous way is giving when you know the recipient's identity, but the recipient doesn't know yours. The fourth is giving when you do not know the recipient's identity, but the recipient knows yours. Number five is giving before being asked. Number six, giving after you have been asked. Number seven is giving less than you should, but giving it cheerfully. And the eighth way, the least righteous, the poorest, the flimsiest, is when you give begrudgingly, oh, I guess. And then we have the Christian giving, which usually starts at giving begrudgingly. It transitions to, well, only if I feel like it, and, oh, here's a dollar. It's what my grandfather gave, too. And it ends with, Well, I'm not giving you a dime until you do what I think you should do. Every major religious tradition identifies that we have a problem with money and stuff. And the way to help us get past that is to require us to give our stuff away or sell it and give to the poor. This might be the equivalent of God yelling at us in every religious language, wake up! Wake up to your own money mania, to the monkey on our back. Now, how many of us have too much stuff? I do. My garage is crammed, and I seriously need to have a rummage sale. Now, how many of us have collected a certain amount of stuff that few people, and probably none of the people who will clean out our house after we die, stuff that they wouldn't think twice about pitching into the dumpster. And how about that precious thing that we all have that takes up space that we only use once in a while or, or we take out and look at only once every blue moon? And how about those piles of clothes that we're never going to fit into again? Jesus is saying, sell it. Give the proceeds to the poor. Give so much that it enables someone else to be self-reliant again. Give to charities before you are asked. That Babe Ruth autographed baseball? Sell it. Fund a youth baseball team. That old guitar? Give it to a young person who's interested in learning music. That accordion gathering dust, sell it and give the money to your neighbor who needs a new roof and can't afford it. You can't take it with you. Sell what you have and give alms to the poor. You don't want to sell all you have? Fine. When is the last time you've sold anything of genuine value and then given the proceeds away? Or do you just keep adding more? Building more and more bigger barns to store your stuff. What are you afraid of? What are you worried about? Our worries consume us. We all have plenty to eat and wear for the most part but we worry about it. Why? Do we want to be able to treat ourselves anytime we want? Do we want to make a good impression on our guests? Do we want to keep up with the neighbors? Do we want more just for the sake of having more? What worries drive us to overconsume? Those worries are what Jesus wants us to set aside. 
be content with what God has given us and don't worry about accumulating wealth or status or whatever. Jesus is telling his assembled crowd to stop being attached to stuff because it consumes you. When we are attached to stuff, we worry about it. Where and how do we store it? Does it need maintenance? What will become of it if there's a flood or a war or if I die? Worry, worry. Worry is the greatest thief of joy. And we worry, don't we? Oh, yeah, we do. Chronic worry. Chronic worry can lead to a host of physical ailments, heart attacks, high blood pressure, ulcers, gastrointestinal problems, muscular aches, pains, skin rashes, eczema, respiratory problems, asthma. Close to one in four people at some point in their life meet the criteria for diagnosable anxiety disorders related to worry, which often require professional treatment. Worry is rampant in our society. It's the result of living in a fast-paced, high-pressure, rapidly changing world. People worry mainly about their children, job security, relationships, and health. But there are other worries that gnaw on us all. We have entire news networks given over to giving us things to worry about. Distant events such as wars and famines in other countries, air disasters, terrorism, crime, random acts of violence, even volatility in the stock market. Jesus' first words in this reading occur hundreds of times in Scripture. Hundreds of times. Do not be afraid. The exact opposite of worry, the opposite of fear. This is the first step. Do not be afraid. Our tendency is to put our hope and trust in our achievements or our acquisitions or our assets. Yet when we are not afraid, we find that we don't need possessions and purchases and procurements. When our treasures are centered in our worth and our identity in the kingdom of God, we don't need to be self-obsessed. So Jesus says, do not be afraid. It is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Like any parent, we want to give our children a life without worry, a life without fear. So does God. We only have to let go of that worry that fear and trust. God will provide. Can any of you, by worrying, add even one hour to your life? The point of almsgiving, of selling our possessions and giving to charity, is first to help us not become so attached to stuff. Secondly, it is to hold up generosity as a mark of our Christian life. When we are free of worry, we can give generously, abundantly. We can give as God gives. We can be the hands and feet of God in this world, making people's lives better. We can build community and relationships. And then we will realize that our treasure is not in the stuff that gathers dust or is eaten by rust or coveted by thieves. Our treasure is in our relationships and in our community. Faith frees us to be generous. Faith allows us to leave worry behind. Faith is evidenced by what we are willing to part with. Faith creates confidence in a life, a future, a way of being in this world that isn't a burden based on what we have or do or achieve, but on a gift that God gives us, a gift that we only need to unwrap and open. We need only open the gift of faith. Then we can sell everything else that possesses and consumes us and freely enter that kingdom where there is no worry and there is no fear. 
Now that's a treasure we can hold on to. Amen. Like